Whatever Next? Lessons from an Unexpected Life. That is the title of Anne Glenn Connor's second book that I'm going to give you a little taste of today. And gee, it is worth just having a listen to some of these stories because they're so entertaining, so honest, and uh, really give you a good insight, particularly into Princess Margaret. Now, I've got a confession to make. I, I'm not a huge fan of Princess Margaret. She sort of, when I read about her and other people's works, I get my back up. She seems a little arrogant. She seems a bit of a bully. Um, she just doesn't seem a very attractive character to me. Now, she was very, very beautiful when she was young, and I did admire her beauty. I think just about everyone does. Some of those early photographs of her, you can't help but think she just looks stunning. She was like movie star beautiful. But the thing is, maybe it was the booze, but... Uh, over her life, she seemed to sort of disintegrate <laughs> from about the age of 18 on. Things just didn't seem to go well. And I think she was one of those people that would have been better off not drinking. Some people can drink like the Queen um, and it doesn't affect her. She can take it or leave it. She can have a good time. She can enjoy a tipple and she's the same person regardless. But Princess Margaret strikes me as someone that couldn't control her alcohol consumption. I mean, a lot of her trouble in her life seems to be in drunken rages, seems to be when she's a bit tight, um, you know, huge arguments that she had in her marriage, all of it sort of going all pear-shaped, inappropriate social things happening. It seems to be related to her booze consumption. And it makes you think, I wonder whether her life would have been different and more fulfilling and more successful if she never had started to drink. When you see, I put up photos in the community, when you see her at 18 and she's full of that young hope and that fresh-faced princess, um, you can really see the potential there and it's a great pity. But there's one thing that is firmly in Princess Margaret's favour and this is why a lot of people actually do really admire her. She was very, very loyal, incredibly loyal. She never betrayed the Queen. She never threw her under the bus. She never did an interview. She never did a tell-all, uh, you know, autobiography. She was always trustworthy in that regard. And I think that's why the Queen loved her so much, because when it all came down to tin tacks, she could trust her. Now, Anglin Connor in this book gives us a great insight into Princess Margaret. It's very honest. The great thing about her is she doesn't seem to have any judgment. She can observe bad behavior, challenging behavior, and she can recant it in a really funny, funny way. But she isn't judgmental. She has this unconditional level of friendship that she holds for Princess Margaret. And she is very grateful to her because when she was going through an incredibly tough time in her life with her horrendous husband, Princess Margaret offered her a lifeline. My friends and family began to see how clearly tired I was. Colin was so very exhausting to live with. There was no room for me as a person because I was always so busy looking after him and anticipating his needs as well as protecting the children. So she spent all those years basically just walking on eggshells. He was prone to sudden rages. He was prone to really picking on her um, and also going after the children. And so she was always keeping them out of his way so that he wouldn't go into a rage. Um, life was extremely difficult. She even went to the extent of having an old caravan that he didn't know about hidden on her property, on their large stately home property. And she used to go away and to the caravan in secret. She would tell him that she was just going for a walk and she would really be in the caravan just having a few hours to herself, basically just trying to recover, basically just trying to get herself together, have a bit of time out where I guess she wouldn't have to be afraid and then she would go back into the fray once more. Princess Margaret offered me a lifeline at around the same time when she asked me to be her lady-in-waiting. Now around the same time is she just also had her twin little girls but Barbara Barnes who is actually Lady Di's nanny uh, for Harry and William when they were really little uh, 
that she was Anne Glen Connor's nanny, and so she was looking after the two little girls. Princess Margaret knew I needed a form of escape from Colin and my royal duties were not something he would protest about. Gl Colin Glen Connor was thrilled with any social connections he could get. Now, obviously, being Lord Glen Connor himself, he had enough social connections, enough cachet with the aristocracy, but his behaviour wasn't standing him in good stead. And if it wasn't for Anne Glen Connor, I don't think he would really still have a connection with royalty. So it was through his wife that his social standing was kept in place. And so he was grateful the fact that Anglin Connor was going to go off and be lady in waiting. He thought he was going to play a much greater part. He thought that he might even get to travel with them on official, you know, visits overseas and things. But Anglin Connor made it very clear right at the outset that that wouldn't be happening. Now we'll get on to the lighter stuff because she tells some really amusing stories about Princess Margaret just behaving awfully <laughs> to people and one of the most hilarious ones I read were a couple an American couple who had been very generous to Princess Margaret's sort of um, charities that she was patron of were actually invited over for Charles and Diana's wedding and they thought that she meant that they were actually invited to the wedding but Anne Glenn Connor tells us that uh, they were rather disappointed on the morning of the royal wedding, they came downstairs in the most lovely outfits, ready to accompany Princess Margaret to St. Paul's Cathedral. But just as she was leaving, she simply called behind her, Oh good, there you are. The television is on in the drawing room for you to watch and there's some sandwiches if you want them. So, um, she then said to Angela and Connor when she got to the church, because Angela and Connor was obviously invited, it's ridiculous, Anne. How could they possibly have thought they were going to the wedding? And then Anne Glen Connor says, but they thought they were. And she says that being a lady-in-waiting to Princess Margaret was not unlike being Colin's wife. In some ways, with the amount of behind-the-scenes troubleshooting it involved and endless, endless diplomacy. Now, an interesting parallel in Anne Glen Connor's book is this parallel where she didn't draw it with Harry, but we can draw it with Harry when she says this about the press and media interest in Princess Margaret and the way she was portrayed by the media. With her sister as a future queen, the press needed a bad princess and Margaret was the only available candidate. The fact she enjoyed the company of creative people, so showbiz types, you know, a cigarette and a drink made it easy to cast her as a rebel to be celebrated or judged, mostly judged. Now, I wonder if Harry's read this book. <laughs> it might have given him an idea for his whinge fest. Now, she goes on to say that she uh, particularly enjoyed friends that didn't want anything from her. Um, people, she used to get frustrated because if friends invited her for dinner, very often they would invite everyone in the local village, everyone they owed a favour to, or everyone they were trying to impress to the same dinner. And Princess Margaret used to get, you know, frustrated because it felt like she had to be on. It felt like she was constantly being asked to perform, you know, um, and she would thought it was just maybe a dinner with friends and turned into a performance or she had to be Princess. Margaret and she got very frustrated with that particularly if she wasn't given the heads up first. I'm going to finish off this video with a great story that she tells and it's it's cruel but it's quite funny and it's about a uh, person that sort of tried to ingratiate themselves with her and Anglin Connor describes it like this. The people Princess Margaret treated worst were probably those who were most desperate to ingratiate themselves with her. And sometimes you just couldn't make her see that she was not behaving well to them. One of these was our friend. So this was difficult for Angela and Connor because it was a mutual friend, Drew Hines, a British-born American philanthropist and patron of the arts. Now, Drew was lovely, kind and generous, but she was so eager to please Princess Margaret that uh, Princess Margaret became a little complacent, which is a very nice way of putting it. So Drew 
goes on to give Princess Margaret this really expensive, ornate fountain for her garden at Kensington Palace. And Drew keeps ringing up Anglin Connor because, you know, being the lady in waiting, saying, did she receive the fountain? Did she receive the fountain? And Princess Margaret, you know, Anne would go and ask and Princess Margaret would say, yes, I just haven't got it out of the box. I haven't even looked at it yet. Whatever. You know, not very nice. And but oh, that would put Anglin Connor in a really difficult position, as you could imagine. Anyway, these phone calls kept going and then eventually Anglin Connor, you know, was happy that Princess Margaret had actually got it out of the box so she could say, oh, yes, it's very beautiful and she's just working out where she's going to put it. Now, this went on and on and on and in the end, Princess Margaret got a sort of malicious, sadistic delight in frustrating this poor woman about this fountain. Well, it gets to the big Chelsea Flower Show and so Drew Hines was actually invited by Princess Margaret to accompany her to the flower show. And so she was invited over early on that day to come and see the fountain. And this is how Anglin Connor describes what happened. Oh, poor Drew. When Drew arrived at Kensington Palace, we finally went off to see the blessed thing. Angela and Connor's getting a bit testy about it by this stage. Setting off through the garden with her. It was a big garden and we went all the way to the end until we reached the very back where Princess Margaret began to push her way through enormous bushes. Poor Drew, all dressed up for the flower show, had to fight her way through leaves and branches, where Princess Margaret had very naughtily placed the fountain on a wall at the back where it was completely invisible. Now that's just mean and malicious, isn't it? And evidently, Princess Margaret took great delight in it. So that's why I don't really like her that much. I find her a bit of a malicious little bully. However, Anne Glenn Connor soothed it over with Drew Hines like this. She said to Drew Hines, she really does love the fountain and that place is her secret spot for when she's feeling down. It was a completely bogus story, but it made Princess Margaret seem a little less rude. And so I guess Princess Margaret can thank Anglin Connor for the for nearly 30 years. She was going around making Princess Margaret look a little bit better than she really was, was soothing ruffled feathers all over the world and was making her seem a little less rude. I hope you enjoyed that insight. I can highly recommend Anglin Connor's second book. Of course, if you haven't read Lady in Waiting, her first book, start with that first because that is a corker. And I'll see you all again really soon. Thanks for joining me. Bye.